For the record, I regret nothing. But Paul, I just now remember you pitched this as everybody's Neville, so I think we're supposed to be passive and wait for problems to happen. Not really, Mason. I know I pitched it to you guys as playing the kids that tattle on everyone, but the way I see it, there's two types of character action. There's the reactive action that a lot of characters take when they want to perpetuate their problems forever. A good example would be comic book characters. They just sit around waiting for a villain to do something, and then they spring into action as a reaction. Paul, in fairness to superheroes, the kind of proof they gather from being proactive is not admissible to court. I know, Elvis, but the point is, if you wait for the villains, they always get to do their schemes, or they come close, and the hero never fully puts a stop to them because, for narrative reasons, the heroes are kind of lazy. The writers want the Joker to attack Batman for the next 100 years, and if Batman tried to stop the Joker before his evil began, it'd be a much different story where the Joker is actually kind of the underdog. That's called procedural crime, Paul. But procedural crime could still be reactive, Lowry. It depends on how you do it. The other type of character action is proactive, where the character sets themselves on an objective, and they carry on until they achieve that objective. In that case, the character sets the pace and the motion. They usually have something that sets them off, but for example, if one day Batman actually decided to hunt down and kill all the villains in the city before they could do more crimes, that'd be very proactive. And morally questionable, and not really in the spirit of Batman. And both of those things. But the point is, Batman would be the driving force of the story in a proactive situation. But in a reactive situation, the Joker is really driving the story. In our games, I usually trust you guys to be proactive, whether good or evil. That still doesn't say we're acting in the good faith of Nevilleness. I guess I'm just saying I'd be surprised if you guys weren't taking your own actions and creating your own conflicts. And whatever, I don't care. So long as you tattle on the other kids, we'll get where I want to go. So anyway, you were just about to enter your first class, taught by Professor Tumbledry. What do we learn from Tumbledry? Do we have a syllabus? You do. And next to his class is a picture of Tumbledry winking and saying, I'll never tell. Weird. Based on the syllabus, it sounds like we could skip this class. But then we'll miss out on the secret. It specifically says on the syllabus he'll never tell. So we should just not go. But maybe he will. That could just be a test. No, it's just marketing. He wants you to go to class, so he has this big secret. But you know what secret it's going to be? We have to buy his book. That's always what it is. You sit through a speech and you too can be an amazing wizard. Buy my book. You know, I never thought of school that way before. But if you cut out a lot of steps, the heart of that is still in there. The books are expensive. I bet Tumble Dry's not even a good author. Regardless, it's on our schedule. And if we don't go to class, we have to tattle on ourselves for truancy. All right, fine. But if I didn't have friends like you guys, I'd skip class and smoke cigarettes. That's why you need us, Mason. You can't smoke cigarettes by the dumpster forever. Someday you'll have to get a job so you can afford those cigarettes. I could always bum cigarettes off people. I guess hustle them like that's a job. Whatever, let's go. You walk inside and find yourself in a fairly normal classroom populated by first-year students like yourself. Everyone quickly divides into red and blue sides of the room and then checks their pockets to make sure their wallets weren't stolen by the other side. I'm watching you, Blues. Once everyone is seated, there's an explosion and a puff of smoke in the center of the room. But when the smoke clears, there's nobody there. Tumble Drive pops up from behind his desk. Ha ha! I fooled you! The first rule of magic is misdirection! Behold! He reaches behind the child's ear. A shilling! I stole that from your wallet while you were keeping an eye on your sworn enemies! There's a lot to learn from what I've just done, but they're not magical lessons, so let's not dwell on it for too long. Now, first thing I need you to do is pull out my textbooks that I asked you all to purchase, and then turn to page 243. You all do so, and all the pages are blank. I fooled you again! Or have I? Hold on to those books, for they may contain hidden secrets. But it wouldn't be a secret if I told you. I raise my hand. Yes, the bright boy there. What is it? Why wouldn't they be secrets if you told us, sir? Well, because then you'd know them. Sure, I'd know them. But not everyone would know. So long as at least one person is in the dark, it's still a secret from them. You know what? You're right. I like you. You're a good student. And the first volunteer for our actual magic lesson. Huzzah! Pa! Tumble Dry waves his hands, and a bed of hot coals bursts up out of the floor, sending embers scattering in all directions. As a wizard, you'll be faced with all kinds of incredible challenges. You may have to drink from an evil seashell, or wear a necklace with your arch nemesis's soul trapped inside of it, or walk across a bed of hot coals because your teacher told you to and he's grading you. Get up, Money Bottom! Walk across those coals! I will give you any amount of money to not have to do that. Name your price, Tumble Dry. I enjoy your nonlinear approach to problems. 
That'll either serve you well or get you destroyed, and both ways get you into some kind of book or newspaper. But I refuse! I'm a man of principle! Now walk your twelve-year-old feet across these coals. Okay, I get up and I cast a spell. Stretch Fifical! Then I stretch my arms up, grab a rafter, and swing over the coals. Tumble Dry regards this thoughtfully, stroking his beard. All right, again, you've come up with an indirect approach to my problem. That's good! However, you weren't walking. I want to see you get through this problem by walking. I guess if I have to, sir. Levitato! Paul, I lift all the coals up with my levitation powers, and then I just walk underneath them. Well, Mr. Moneybottom, you've thwarted me again. Though once again not in the spirit of the request. Still, you do that three times and it becomes a storybook thing, and I'm not one to take the bow off of a story thing, so wrap it up. Take it, you win this round, Mr. Moneybottom. But I'll get you yet. Though I hope I won't. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I, I raise my hand. Fool, it was a trick! With a wave of his wand, a geyser of water shoots down from the ceiling and into a bottomless hole. He grabs you with his magic and hurls you into the water. Now here's a real test! Most magic requires a wand and some magic words, though if you get really good, you don't need either. You first years, of course, need both. So, what do you do if you're being magically drawn by one of your teachers, huh? Oh, well, I make rude gestures that tumble dry as I drown to death. Well, I love the spirit, Mr. Nostalgia Bottom, but that's not saving you. You'll have to really use your brain. Or something special with those fingers, I suppose. What do you think the answer is? Levitato! I grab a blue student and hurl him into Mason, knocking Mason out of the water. All right, you grab a surprised kid and sacrifice him for your friend. The new victim looks a bit bewildered and then starts choking. G <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, it seems, Mason, that you've used the power of friendship, the most potent spell of all. And it doesn't even require a magic word. Well done. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I'm learning so much right now. Though I do have to wonder, Elvis, why sacrifice a blue student in the process? The blue student is still struggling to escape. Uh, well, sir, I figured any problem can also be a solution. Goodness. You're going places, Mr. Moneybottom. Though in this case, you're mistaken. He waves his wand and the water vanishes. The blue student drops to the floor. Where the heck were your friends? Go back to your seat. You'll have to think of another less murdery way to eliminate your competition, Elvis. But keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> yeah. Now, can I get a volunteer for my next lesson? All right, kill me. I'm not going to kill you. Just teach you a valuable life lesson about thinking outside the box. And I may or may not punish you for getting the right answer. <laughs> life is random like that. Don't take it easy on me, coach. Hit me. I was born for this. All right, then. Get ready Let for- Levitato! Paul, I knocked the wand out of Tumble Dry's hand. Okay. He's surprised, so there goes his wand. Good heavens, Elvis. I like you. I really like you. Oh, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. You're going to be my star pupil. But did you account for this? He pulls two more wands out of his sleeves and wields one in either hand. Can you get them both, huh? Before I zap you? I'll try. Levitato! All right, that's two attacks in one turn, so you got a penalty. But that's a really good roll. So, both wands go flying in opposite directions. Excellent reflexes, Elvis. But what will you do about this? He rolls behind his desk, then yanks out a drawer, revealing an entire stockpile of magic wands. He pulls out two more. How many times can you take them away, huh? I can do this all day. Knock over my desk. Levitato! I hurl his entire desk through the window, then I duck behind my desk. Snapshot. Penalty. But the roll's good. You now have cover. The desk crashes through the ancient windows of the school, sending wands scattering in all directions on its way out. It'll land somewhere in the courtyard, and good luck to anyone down there. Throwing around a lot of magic, aren't you, Elvis? You must be getting pretty tired. <sighs> uh, yep, but all you've got now is two wines. That was pretty quick thinking. Couldn't beat me in attrition, so you threw out the whole stockpile. Smart. Smart. Never attack a stronger opponent head on. All I gotta do is get those two you have left, sir. And you can't disarm me, because my wand has a wrist strap. You know, I kick myself for not thinking of the same thing. Ah, oh, the money I would have saved, and I thought I was smart. Uh, but guess what? Levitato! Elvis, he slides away your desk, then physically grabs you and hurls you out the broken window. Ah, the cover did nothing! I can just throw the whole baby out with the bathwater! Levitato, I catch Elvis. You grab him. 
Oh, thank goodness. Once again, the power of friendship prevails, but this time to reward your previous good deeds, Mr. Elvis. I dare say you barely need the assistance of derp toads, which is why you're going to do so well here and why I'm going to focus just so many resources on you. Ah, but anyway, we've still got tons more class to do, so moving on. Uh, sir, I wanted to say something. Go ahead, Mason. Ultimate Nostalgia Bottom Family Attack. Things were better when they used to be good. Nova Cannon Configuration Mark III. <laughs> that, that is a lot of dice. What are you doing? Okay, mental illusions. He goes back to his fondest memory and relives his entire life from that point onward until either he dies or snaps out of it. <laughs> okay, wow, that is, that's an 82. It's the only spell I know. So what are you, like, Gilderoy Lockhart? No. Who was that? Oh, the memory guy. Yeah, the guy who erased everyone's memories and then took credit for their stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Paul. Oh, uh, that guy. Okay, in this game system, this that's how the game system would have it. That guy was very good at only the one spell, and you know why? It cost all your character points. This is an expensive power. Okay, so Mason, just to reiterate, assuming you got past all of Tumble Dry's passive magical defenses just now... He's reliving his entire life from his happiest memory onward. I mean, if he has passive mental defenses, that's kind of a fly in the ointment. But otherwise, yeah. All right. He approaches a hat rack in the corner of his office. Oh, Betty Nostalgia Bottom fancy running into you here. <laughs> I know, I know, I invited you. Wait a minute. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I've always fancied you. Tumble dry. No, that's my grand grand. You can't love her. She's old. Oh, you feel the same way? Thank heavens. Oh, you made me so happy. I just... Oh, come here, you. He starts passionately making out with the hat rack. Uh, uh, oh. Mason, your grand-grand dated tumble dry? I guess. Well, there's no levitating out of this. He just keeps going. You're not sure if it's gonna stop. You're pretty sure he goosed the hat rack's backside. Uh, uh. How long is this gonna last? Uh, I, I mean, if he doesn't get over it within about a minute, then... Give him 15, and if not by then, tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, next year. Failing that, basically forever. Well, then I guess we'll just wait him out. All right. The class waits out Tumble Dry's makeout session, which carries on graphically and disgustingly for pretty much the rest of class. Eventually, the kids work up the confidence to start talking amongst themselves, and several of the red team approach you guys over your amazing performance. They think it was pretty awesome how you threw that desk out the window. Thanks. I do it all the time at home. Uh, excuse me, I'm the one who got tumble dry to start making out with the hat rack? At last, the giant musical bells start clanging, signaling the end of class. Whoops, looks like we're all out of time. Your homework is to get into one fight and actually win it. Now get out. Me and Mrs. Nostalgia Bottom need some privacy. Wait. So wait. Did my spell not even work? Did I not just tell you I need privacy, Mason? Get out of here. Truly, the legend of this man's genius is completely understated. If you can call it genius, what did he have to gain? He certainly defeated you completely. I, I mean, uh, uh, whose class is next? It appears Professor McDougal teaches your next class. I feel ready for her. I feel ready for anything. Let's go throw her through a window. I, well, I guess I don't have any diversionary plans this time, so let's go straight to class. Wait, I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, first the bathroom, then war! You find one of the bathrooms. There's an undead ghoul just hanging around eating half a dead rat. It doesn't seem to pay you much attention, Lowry. I'm sure this is normal and everything's fine. I go about my business, wash my hands. Keep on keeping on, ghoul. Go outside. Hey, are you guys starting to wonder if maybe Dorp Toads kind of sucks? I'm really enjoying it so far. I feel like this is really my element. Well, sure, as one of the few kids who received any amount of positive attention, I guess it's fine. But there's a flesh-eating undead in the bathroom, and I feel like that's a real time bomb. I'm sure it's not that bad. He's probably a janitor or something. Mason, his rotting flesh definitely smells worse than anything else in the bathroom. And that's what I thought at first, too. But in the clarity of an empty bladder, I realize there's no functional reason to have a ghoul in the bathroom. If it were a problem, someone would put up a sign. Maybe we're supposed to put up the sign. We can't do that. We don't have the authority. I don't know. It seems like maybe Tumble Dry is testing us again. See, you think you have the right answer by staying inside the lines when you're actually supposed to be making everything up according to your feelings and personal biases. My personal feeling is that it's not our job to warn the other students about a ghoul in the bathroom if the faculty won't bother to take those steps themselves. 
Besides, it'll be funny. I mean, it just takes us a second. Paul, I produce a magic marker and write, Beware of Ghoul on the bathroom door. Just as you finish doing so, there's an explosion and Tumble Dry is standing behind you. Oh, it's you guys again. Hey, did you know that people have been ignoring that ghoul in there for almost an entire generation of students? It's eaten six kids. You're the first ones to finally put up a warning for everyone. 50 points for Red Team! There's another explosion, and he's gone. You see, I think I got Tumble Dry all figured out. I guess I got lucky. Or the ghoul just isn't a very active hunter. It would have literally had me with my pants down. Well, let's get to class before we run into another test. It's not that I don't like our string of success, but we only have to fail one time before it becomes a real problem, and I don't see reason to push our luck. Okay, I'll lead on. Through twists and turns, floating staircases, paintings that are actually doors, doors that are actually paintings, and one detour because they're repaving a section of the building, you arrive at McDougal's classroom long before most other students. All right, Paul. What's the syllabus say that this one's about? Practical basics and spellcraft. Oh, then we got that after the walk on the hot coals? At least now we know what kind of things we're going to apply the basics to. In we go. I'm ready. I can take it. You walk into a nearly empty classroom to find Professor McDougal tidying up and preparing. Ah, looks like the bottom trio is first before the bell. Ma'am, could you please never call us that again? We prefer to be called the Ultra Bottom Squad. I'm Money Bottom! Strike a dramatic pose. And I'm Water Bottom. Strike a mirror pose to Elvis. I talk to water. Uh, and I'm Nostalgia Bottom. Reluctantly strike a pose. Come on, Mason, up your game. My, how very creative. Thanks. You wouldn't believe how long it took us to come up with that. Didn't we just meet today? Seconds. It took us mere seconds. Oh, yeah. Well, though, in fairness, Elvis, we're just copying popular Japanese media. So I wouldn't say it's fair to call us creative. Man, I'm a downer today. Well, there's no such thing as anything truly original. Everything is copying popular Japanese media. That's not true. What about... Egypt? They copied Yu-Gi-Oh! Egypt predates Yu-Gi-Oh, Elvis. I think it's really more of a chicken and the egg type of thing, Mason. Actually, we were going to learn today that Japan is really the source of magic and life on Earth, but it's kind of a crazy supernatural time loop sort of thing, so it hasn't happened yet. See, Mason, if you just read the textbook before class, you could avoid looking stupid like this. Man, well, you know what? Things are going to be better for me in the future, which is actually the past, apparently, just quite a long ways off. More students begin to stream in at the last minute. McDougal says, take your seats, everyone. Everybody gets situated, and she picks up her notebook, opens to the first page, and then frowns. Oh. She walks over to a pile of crates and pulls away a tarp, revealing a cage full of half-lizard, half-bird creatures with bags over their heads. Oh, I see. Well, students, we were going to cover a brief history of magic and learn some basic spell composition, but it looks like Professor Tumble Dry has decided to include a bit of an extra, and... You know, he makes the rules. I'm surprised we didn't hear those things. Yes, well, they've been made magically silent. Here, pass a cockatrice around to the left until everyone has one or there's no more left to pass around. And the students begin passing around these animals, which actually are scratching, thrashing, and trying to escape. Miss McDougal, is there a way we're supposed to hold these, or...? Just try to keep the claws away from you. Now, every problem in life has one single esoteric spell that will solve that problem outright but it will only solve that one particular problem. Oh, I know the one. Levitato! I launch my cockatrice out the window. Crash! You obliterate another window, and the cockatrice with it, successfully defeating the creature. I suppose there are... alternative methods for dealing with any given problem, if you feel confident. However, if this were a test, I'd just give you an F, Mr. Elvis. Oh, but I beat the cockatrice. But did that spell require you to have eye contact on the animal? I mean, yeah. But I could also levitate all kinds of things. Like a metric ton of dirt, I could just bury stuff. Well, the creative use of levitato is not the point of this lesson. We're going to learn the phrase that defeats all cockatrices, but specifically only cockatrices. That way you can defeat a cockatrice even if you forget the phrase for levitato. Well, I use levitato all the time, so I, I'm probably not ever going to forget it. That's it, I'm deducting three points from Red Team. Ah. Don't complain or it'll be three more. This is a classroom. You do as you're told, and we'll all survive. Now, the important thing here is that the cockatrice does not make eye contact with you, or else you'll be frozen into stone. A student in the back appears to be having some trouble with his animal. It gets a claw underneath the hood, and- Pulvis. All right, pulvis. Lowry, what does that do? It causes all the dust in the room to go poof, rise up in the air, and then fly directly into everyone's eyes. Including yours? Um... You know what, I didn't think about that when I designed the spell, so it looks like we all suffer. 
All right, everyone screams. Ah! Ah! Lowry! I saved your life, shut up. A little warning next time, Mr. Lowry? You're all just a bunch of ingrates. How long is everyone blind? Uh, looks like about a minute. It burns! When I can okay, see again, just, I'm going to dump the whole pencil sharpener closed. in your face, I, Lowry. All right, I now cover my eyes to, without please your dang down. assault. Please, simmer down. Okay. So the spell to defeat a cockatrice is cockatruckle. And you all hear the sound of some kind of magic. It sounds like someone tossed a gyro into a large triangle. A uh, bang You may have dropped your bird in the confusion, but if not, you feel it go limp in your hands. Okay. Calm down. All the animals should be subdued. But keep your eyes shielded. They are still dangerous. Please do your best to find the wall, then follow it to the exit. And everyone kind of stumbles and shuffles their way out. Professor, is it true that the founder of the school enchanted a giant cockatrice to live in the walls and kill mixed-race kids? Uh, well, we don't like to talk about some of the more dated worldviews of our founders. But yes, there is an ancient immortal wild cockatrice that specifically commits hate crimes. And it lives in the school. But we've been keeping it mostly subdued during the school year. So, we don't need any more letters from your parents. I heard there's a secret word that makes knives fly out of the walls and stab you to death. Uh, yes, that's unrelated. But one of our professors was a bit of a prankster. Uh, we're not going to divulge what that word is, so just rest assured you wouldn't use it in a normal conversation. Is it divulge? No, Mason, I just used that word, and... If it were the word, I would have been stabbed to death. Well, it just seemed like a weird word. Like, I feel like I don't hear that word very All often. All right, I need to concentrate. There are several spells that could be used to resolve this problem. She looks around. I don't suppose everyone grabbed their things. Isn't there a specific spell that just makes them all go away? There is, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. You know, this is supposed to be Skippy Bottom's thing, but I know that he'd never take this sitting down. And I shouldn't either. I have half a mind. As soon as the headmaster isn't busy with more important matters, I'll have a word with him. But for now, um, I suppose I'll just... <laughs> she opens the door a crack. Micro, wave them! Then she shuts the door. So we'll just let that sit for about four minutes, and then I suppose we'll let it cool down for another ten or fifteen. One of us could have levitated our book bag and checked to see what spell makes cockatrices go away. I wish you'd suggested that earlier. You hear some popping sounds behind the door. It's all right. I know a spell to get blood and viscera out of garments, books, walls, you name it. I've worked with Headmaster Tumbledry a long time. Everyone stands around for a while in awkward silence. Is the word peanut? No, it's something you'd never use in a normal conversation. What about thermometer? You know what? Let's try and learn what we can without my notes. And she does her best to deliver a partial lecture, but as it turns out, she's not very good without her notes to get by, and it's kind of a mess. Eventually, the bells ring again. Professor McDougal sneaks inside the classroom to supposedly clean your stuff. And it's time to set off for class with Professor Ficklethick. 